Uh, now that we have had the very real pleasure of being peacefully educated by the Black Lives Matter movement over the last few weeks, uh, what have we as whites and oppressors actually learned? Well, first, we now understand that as whites, we are all guilty all of the time. Historical racism, structural racism, uh, systemic racism, unconscious racism, subconscious racism. We are guilty of all of these and we must accept and indeed prostrate ourselves before the original sin of being born white. And we must work tirelessly to both recognise and act upon our collective guilt, our collective privilege and our collective power uh, centred around our near criminal white existence. And were my parents both still alive, I wouldn't hesitate in giving them a damn good tongue lashing for furthering the oppression of all people of colour by bringing me into the world. I would tell them how ashamed they should be for not aborting me immediately. My father should have been given a compulsory vasectomy before he pro uh, procreated, of course, and my mother should have hired the services of a local man of colour to impregnate her in order to at least dilute by half uh, the oppressive imperialistic and supremacist genetic makeup of her offspring. Alas though, this didn't happen, so here I am today, a white man indeed, but a repentant white man. A white man seeking to absolve the original sin of his whiteness, and not to just recognise my innate racism, but to actually do something about it. Uh, to become a fully-fledged anti-racist, uh, as per the demands of Black Lives Matter, um, in order to do my bit to make the world a better place for oppressed people of colour everywhere. And there are several stages to this, the first being to recognise the ghastly truth. So here are some top tips uh, to follow in your route to anti-racist activism. Every morning when you wake up, uh, if you're white of course, you should look at your wicked whiteness in the bathroom mirror and say to yourself, I am a racist, I am a fascist, I am an oppressor, I am privileged, I accept these evils to be true and I swear to overcome them. Now by doing this you will make your subconscious racism conscious, uh, which can then be attacked head-on via constant mental counter-argument during the day. Now after that, a, a quick splash and spruce up is in order and then off to work. And should you happen to see a person of colour on the street whilst on your commute, uh, you should gently and submissively approach them with your arms held out in a beseeching manner whilst apologising for past colonial sins uh, prior to offering them a pound coin or at least 50p uh, as a form of financial reparation. Now I have to say I do this all the time and the people of colour are always tremendously gratified by uh, such sincere anti-racist action. And if other white people are doing the same thing, uh, you should all take a communal knee and form a disorderly queue in order to pay homage. I say disorderly because an orderly queue might be construed as an imperialistic expression of prototypical white behavioural patterns. Um, having reached your place of work, uh, be it in academia, the media, teaching or other such areas of progressive correct thought, uh, all good anti-racists should behave in a manner whereby every discussion uh, every act, every glance, every smile or frown should be viewed through the prism of race and through the prism of the oppressor and the oppressed. Uh, never allow yourself to be fobbed off with the diversionary tactics uh, utilised by the racists and the fascists. For example, if a fellow white worker offers you a cheery good morning as he breezes past the water cooler, immediately reply along the lines of a a good morning for you perhaps, but not so good for people of colour held down and trampled upon by the repressive forces of white privilege pervading the atmosphere all around us, Bob. Now such a retort should immediately bring about the desired reaction, a uh, vis an abject apology for his failure to ceaselessly contemplate global racial injustice. Uh, in some rare instances, 
uh, some of the more resistant members of the white race might refuse uh, to apologise for their cheery good morning, or indeed their gloomy observations with regard to inclement weather. For example, uh, if your greeting of morning bill structural racism is endemic, isn't it, uh, is responded to with yeah, morning tower queen, I'm not sure about that, but it certainly looks like rain later, then you, as a keenly ambitious anti-racist, have set the trap and ensnared your dreadful racist victim. And the best way of dealing with such hateful and wicked reactionaries uh, in an office environment is to call upon your white comrades to encircle them uh, while shrieking racist, fascist, Nazi at them until they emotionally break down, uh, fall to the floor and confess their sins. It's also advisable in these instances to report them for racially aggravated hostility uh, to the racial equality commissar within the HR department who will quickly and efficiently make sure the race war saboteur loses his or her job and is placed on an employment whitelist. You know, such people don't deserve to earn a living and provide for their children in these socially aware times of tolerance and diversity. On your way home after work, should you happen to see a group of enlightened anti-racists of colour uh, dispensing racial justice to a lone person of no colour uh, on the ground, suspected of being a member of the far right, there are a number of ways to behave in the correct manner. Uh, the most important one is not to project imperialistic aggression by intervening. The recommended course of action is to adopt a, a kneeling position uh, to open your arms wide in order to expand the lungs and to loudly shout, I stand with the oppressed, down with the racist oppressors. And the benefits of exhibiting such uh, racial, uh, racially revolutionary behaviour are threefold. Uh, number one, you will experience a feeling of glowing virtue. Uh, number two, uh, you bravely avoid a good social justice kicking. And number three, you will avoid the 5am knock on your door from the police services who now exist in the main to hunt down and prosecute uh, those who seek to thwart the delivery of restorative racial justice, uh, thereby ending up on the wrong side of the hate crime laws. No one says it's easy to be a full-time anti-racist, and indeed it is not. It's exhausting. But after a day spent absolving your white privilege, don't let your guard drop when you finally get home to Islington, Chelsea, or wherever it is your mummy chose to buy the family home. It's so easy to automatically pop the kettle on to make yourself a nice soothing cup of fair trade tea, but always be aware of the possible racism inherent in this seemingly mundane act. Do you sweeten the tea with sugar? White sugar or brown sugar? Do you favour brown sugar in order to show racial solidarity? Or might that be looked upon as racially condescending and thus driven by the guilt of your white privilege? If you choose white sugar, are you doing so because your subconscious is telling you white sugar is in some ways superior to brown sugar? Both sweetening choices are laden with implicit racist connotations, uh, not to mention the evils of sugar production, both historically and today. So perhaps it's better for white anti-racists uh, just to avoid sugar altogether. The next problem is what to eat. Cultural appropriation is real and must be avoided at all costs. A good anti-racist should decolonize his or her fridge and larder. Uh, Uncle Ben's rice is clearly riven with hateful racist imagery and should be consigned to the bin, along with each and every foodstuff outside the white man's traditional diet. I'm afraid to say this would also include chips. Uh, given the evil appropriation of the humble potato many years ago by Sir Walter Raleigh, who in an act of obscene imperialist supremacy brazenly uprooted the indigenous tuber in front of the downcast eyes of subjective Native Americans. Now some might say there is little left to eat for a committed white anti-racist, but this should be viewed as a good thing. A hungry white man is a penitent white man, and without penitence, the white man's journey into anti-racism 
cannot even begin. So a small bowl of thin gruel is quite sufficient, followed by some educational television uh, in order to wind down after a hard day's anti-racism. Now clearly some TV programmes should be avoided. Uh, anything with Jeremy Clarkson in it is obviously not permissible. Indeed, all populist, humorous and therefore racist light entertainment shows made before 2020, uh, such as Friends or Seinfeld, for example, should be labelled as reactionary racist relics and consigned to the memory hole. It's far better to simply watch the BBC News, CNN News, Channel 4 News or Sky News in order to get an impartial, accurate and broad-ranging grasp of national and international events are all presented with charm and an engaging honesty by professional journalists whose number one priority is unbiased fact and reality. Uh, many of you would have noticed the deep-seated integrity and the honourable quest for the truth uh, exhibited by these plucky journalists in their recent reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement, which was presented to us as a politically impartial human rights movement driven by a desire to protect the lives of all people of colour, or at least black people of colour, or at the very least black people of colour who aren't policemen or policewomen. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm not sure where Black Lives Matter stand with regard to brown people, now I come to think about it. But, uh, <laughs> perhaps someone should ask. Uh, but thankfully, though, the central message of collective white guilt has been fully absorbed by the nation's deep-thinking footballers and philosophical sports journalists, uh, such as the Daily Telegraph's Paul Haywood, along with all the politicians, and somewhat masochistically, the police themselves, uh, many of whom have taken the knee, uh, in some cases both knees when it comes to senior police officers, be they white, black, brown, heteronormative or commissioner dick, uh, thus leaving any criticism of Black Lives Matter solely in the hands of the racists, fascists and Nazis, who try to discredit this admirable and wholesome organisation with scurrilous claims that if the police were defunded and the prisons emptied, as per Black Lives Matter demands, uh, it's quite likely that the deaths of hundreds of youths of colour, uh, falling victim to the knives of other youths of colour, would rapidly grow into thousands without the police on the streets to stop them, which rather goes against, uh, which rather goes against the central core of Black Lives Matter uh, raison d'etre. According to the ghastly and reprehensible racists on social media, I should point out, but fortunately though our thoroughly professional and morally decent journalists never ask such questions of Black Lives Matter leaders, and quite rightly so. Uh, who are we, as privileged whites, to question the sincerity and validity of people of colour? If ever there was an example of overt and blatant cultural colonialism, then surely that would be it. No questions, I say. Instead, we should all take the knee and give praise to the BLM movement for their inspired, peaceful, compassionate ideology and rhetoric, which can only strengthen the ties that bind multicultural communities together and has in no way, and I want to be really clear about this, uh, set black against white and white against black, thereby destroying in one fell swoop all the advances made in Britain's race relations over the last 50 years. And with such positive progressive thoughts, it's time for bed for keen young anti-racists, but a word of warning, no matter how hard you try to promote anti-racism each and every day, the nights can be testing. As you settle into a deep slumber, racist dreams can sometimes make themselves apparent. For example, even I, the other night, awoke in a cold sweat, shaking uncontrollably and hysterically quoting Martin Luther King's now thankfully discredited and wickedly racist mumbo-jumbo about judging people by the content of their character rather than the colour of their skin. And this, of course, is no longer in tune with the ideology of Black Lives Matter, so such counter-revolutionary dream crime uh, must be resisted with all of our anti-racist mental strength. And should you be concerned about dreaming politically impure thoughts, there's a new device on the market called a prejudometer. It's the brainchild of Dr. Sigmund Spoonbender, a head of the Viennese School of Postmodern Racial Psychoses. 
It's a mains-powered device uh, with a special anti-racist app built into the software, and it connects via electrodes to the forehead and a crocodile clip uh, to the testicles. And the merest hint of dreams involving the dangerous and subversive ideas of Martin Luther King uh, triggers the prejudometer, and it delivers a short, sharp shock uh, just where it hurts. I have one myself now, and I can assure all you budding young anti-racists out there, it works brilliantly well. I no longer have racist dreams which involve the driving ideology of Martin Luther King, and now I sleep like a baby, whilst dreaming only of skin colour rather than the content of character, just as Black Lives Matter would wish me to do.